Hello everyone, good afternoon from Germany to uh, all the places that you guys are um, joining us today. <clears throat> I can see that we have a quite international uh, group of people here. That's very, very nice. Um, today is a very special webinar because uh, for the first time we have a guest with us that is not a part of Klang actually. Uh, we had already Pascal, my colleague, with us. But this time we have uh, my dear buddy Jens Bubis Stefan with us. Um, he is one of the most respected monitor engineers in, in Germany. Um, he's actually one of the best guys that I know personally. He does fantastic mixes, has a very good workflow. And he's also a Klang user since uh, I think more than five years actually. Uh, we'll have to ask him ourselves once he's joining us. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, um, Bubis um, has a long history in audio, um, not only in, uh, on, in monitor world, but also front of house in studios and so on. At the moment, he's working as a monitor engineer for uh, Max Giesinger. Um, it's one of the, the biggest productions in Germany right now. Um, Iranian pop star Abby and um, Söhne Mannheims, also a German production. On the front of house side, um, he did um, bands like um, Van and Blas and uh, Julia Nigel. And yeah, I think he will be happy to tell us a little bit more <coughs> about his whole story. I'm just showing you a couple of pictures where you can see him in action. Um, actually, there are some pictures of him in Monitor World or front of house, but he also has a quite interesting part of his uh, business and work where he is doing trainings for Digico and Klang and so on. But let's just pull him in. Bobes, hello. Hey, hello everybody. Very hello nice Phil. To see you. Okay, nice hey Bobes, how are you doing? I'm doing fine at Great. the moment, to be honest. Yeah. Where, where are you? Are you at home? Uh, I'm uh, um, basically in our office, which is near my home. Um, because uh, we have two kids and it's uh, easier for all of us uh, that I'm here the moment by myself. But, <laughs> yeah. I got it, yeah. <clears throat> that, that sounds good. Are you missing uh, being behind the board? Um, for the first couple of days and weeks, to be honest, not, because it was already too much for this year. But uh, now the feeling is coming back that I want to uh, be with my friends and family on the road and uh, doing uh, great shows and transporting some emotions. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Um, by the way, actually, the main reason why Bubis is with us is actually because we're just brothers in hair, you know. Absolutely. And, and a beard. <laughs> Almost. And beard, <laughs> actually. <laughs> I just need to get new glasses, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Bobis, um, can you tell us a little bit um, about your um, current work as well as how you got into the position that you are today, your, your story? Maybe let's start with, with the productions that you're doing at the moment. Yeah. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm doing, um, as you mentioned, uh, the, um, the singer Max Giesinger um, in Germany in all the uh, foreign uh, near German countries and which he is really quite popular so we I guess we played last year about nearly 70 shows um, with uh, touring and festivals and it's a lot of fun good people and um, also to be honest I'm love to working with those guys and this is also one of my uh, benefits uh, that I'm now in the position to choose for which artist um, and crew I want to work. So uh, then it makes really, really easy for all of us. Nice. And how I get into the business is uh, quite easy uh, because I was a musician um, first, played guitar in some bands, but... Actually, really, really soon, um, I was realized that um, I'm not going to make it as a musician. So um, I find my way um, into the business somehow. So I always want to be a guy behind the board, first of all, in the studio. But then it realized that it's shifting over to the live application. 
which I really love. So uh, I was lucky to, <laughs> to getting into those uh, those the business. Well, yeah, there's there's always a couple of elements, and luck is definitely a, an important point, and you know, being at the right time, <clears throat> in the right place, and knowing Absolutely. the right people. Um, but I think um, we're, we're going to talk about a few of the things that we can control, actually, when we want to do a career in, in, in monitors um, and some of the skills that, uh, you know, you learned over the, the, the years. But we'll get to yep. that in a little bit. Um, so your studio side, that was pretty interesting. I mean, if I remember correctly, you even had like a really nice analog SSL board, right? Yes, yes, that's Ooh. true. Uh, I owned an uh, SSL 5000 broadcast, um, broadcast console. Sweet. Um, yeah, with, um, it had 36 channels, full equipped with Dynamics and all of it. So it was a really, really nice board. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I had to sell it. So... <sighs> Uh, but that, that's uh, uh, I, I have some days where I uh, find some tears in my eyes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> life is moving on. That's yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah, and you probably would have had a hard time to to convince um, the trucking companies to just take the SSL board as a monitor board on the road, right? <laughs> Although it would have been cool. <laughs> it would have been cool. Yeah, actually, that especially that board was uh, was built into a mobile truck to uh, for a German uh, radio. Um, station and they would use to um, broadcast live jazz and blues concerts uh, on air so it was really a nice musical mixing board but it was so unbelievably heavy um, <laughs> you need 10 people to move it so it was impossible <laughs> to to even think about it so i see <laughs> get it away out of my head so yeah yeah i see i see so <clears throat> So you did you did a whole bunch of studio stuff. You told me earlier that that you you even did a lot of mastering for for uh, vinyl and all that stuff. So it's really interesting Absolutely. stuff. Um, yeah. But nowadays you're more or less doing exclusively monitors, right? Are you still yes. doing front of house jobs every now and then? Um, I get last year I had one front of house job. Okay. It was it was fun absolutely, but um, I needed a couple of I f it felt like hours to get him back into that situation, mm. to being on the other side of the cable. Um, but I really love to doing monitors, especially um, in-ear monitoring. Perfect, yeah. So, so was it a conscious decision of yours to go into monitors, or was that something that just happened? Um, I think it was uh, both. So first of all, I um, like not to be in the audience. So I need my space around uh, myself. And um, most of the times at, at audience positions, it's really a limited uh, amount of space. Um, sometimes I'm saying um, I hate people, um, but I love to work in with artists on, on, a really, um, on a really intimate base. And that's where the monitor, especially the inner monitoring is... Um, is a it's a huge part of it mm. so i'm enjoying to be in with artists in controlled situations <laughs> okay i see yeah that makes that makes total sense yeah <laughs> so um we are um in close contact since i think a bit more than five years now um you were actually one of the first um clang users um with a band called glasspernspiel true it's a german yes. production um, so I think we met at, uh, at ProLine and Sound at some point, right? I mean, we had some friends in yeah, Sound, but... Um, absolutely, yeah. We yeah. met at the concert over there, yeah. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as I just recently learned, you are the proud owner of a uh, Neumann dummy head. So yes. actually, you, you, this was not your first experience in uh, immersive audio, right? <clears throat> No, I'm really, uh, really done a lot of experiments uh, with immersive audio, especially with the Neumann uh, dummy head to use it for recordings. Mm -hmm. So it was at some point it was my go-to overhead microphone. So which is really, yes, absolutely. So yeah. it gives uh, the sound when you, uh, as we all hopefully know, uh, or <laughs> can explain it. So the difference between an, an, an immersive 
audio situation is that the left signal is just appears on the left ear and the right on the right ear, um, um, of course, uh, and it's not uh, getting crossed or delayed by some walls and you get a mismatch of everything. Yeah. Um, but when you're taking a an, an, an dummy hut recording and uh, spread it out on speakers, it gives uh, some kind of half of a fishbowl effect. So it gets a lot of depth into the sound. And um, when you playing with delay times with closed mics, and so on you get really really interesting sounds and um sounds soundscapes to be honest mm -hmm. and it was quite funny cool. in some in some studio situations when the drummer is faced against another head uh, <laughs> and and then them setting up some baseball caps and or some classes to making fun out of it um <laughs> which is really good for some uh, recording moods I when see, everything is getting tensed and then let's bring a little bit of fun in it and uh, let's move on with a good recording <laughs> well that that's the cliche right i mean uh, we germans don't have humor right that's that's what everybody says especially my american colleagues always tell me that um <laughs> so the only thing we need is just a dummy head and that's the point Absolutely. where we get where we become funny right yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. So that was that was interesting. So I guess we we kind of stormed through an open door for you uh, when we when we proposed to to just give uh, Kleinfabrik a test run there. Um, yeah. What what was your first impression back then? What what made you decide to actually implement it into into the production back then? Mm, to be really really honest, is I always um, was try to finding a way to to specialize myself and to creating a signature sound that I could provide to the, to the customer, to the, to the artist. And I'm really, really soon um, um, uh, saw that uh, Clank Fabric could be a good, good tool for that. And uh, that was my, one of my first impressions. So it sounds different, it sounds natural and that's mm. my goal in audio spe specific worlds that i'm always trying to get every sound or uh, look at every sounds uh, as natural as possible so this is my goal and go to sp um, go to thing you know? mm. and also uh, then the client fabric was one of the closest tools to getting to getting that goal because mm can be sound really, really natural. And it has a lot of benefits for me. Mm -hmm. so. Nice, okay. And what's, what was the reaction of your, your artists back then? Because, um, I mean, now Klang is, is relatively known amongst the, the engineers, but also some or most professional musicians. But back then, nobody knew what Klang was. Was it hard no. to, to explain it to them or did you just do it? Uh, I just did it. Because explaining okay. is, even nowadays, is hard. Mm. And um, I'm just trying to uh, just give it a good, a good basic uh, layout of sounds mm. and talk to the artist uh, after a couple of minutes or after a run through a set, uh, a couple of songs or um, some phrases, whatever. And uh, then we're working on, uh, on positions and um, what really the musician is is achieving and what he is really wants to hear on some positions because mm. um, a keyboarder, a keyboard player will be hearing everything differently than a singer. Mm. Um, sounds um, uh, from the sound positions and from the uh, frequency um, range, mm. for an example. Yeah, that and that's that so, sense, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's a lot of talking, a lot of fine tuning, um, and so on. And I'm Nowadays, uh, more a uh, try and error guy, just to <laughs> to see what works. If it's not working, let's do it the other way around and uh, let's move on. Perfect. So. Perfect. Okay, that sounds good. So and then, um, so you were working with Glassbench for for quite a while, um, and yeah. after you implemented Klang, <clears throat> you kept working with them for um, one and a half years, I think, around. Yeah. Or two yeah. Years. Well, two years. Yeah, I think it was two years. Something. And then. Yeah. And then you got an offer from, <coughs> from uh, the Max Giesinger, no, the Söhne Mannheims production, correct? Söhne Mannheims, yeah. 
Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so you had correct. to leave Glasspernspiel. Yes. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, for that time, but one I... door is open, other one is closing, and you know, so on. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the the, the 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 unit that you were using back there was that your personal unit or did was it a spec unit or did did, did the band own it? No, oh, it was my first of all it was my own um, personal unit, mm -hmm. and the band at the end decided to um, to purchase an own a known one because they was really happy what Clang is doing, and uh, they want to um, keep up that uh, um, that sounds. Um, that they're using for quite a while so was the easiest way to for them to just moving on yeah perfect, perfect. and, and uh, keep on working with it nice yeah yeah they're, they're still they're still working with it um Absolutely. i was visiting them i think last year actually last time oh, okay yeah so Good. that was that was nice um okay so and then um let's uh fast forward a little bit um, to, to Max Giesinger, um, because if I remember correctly, um, you started with a really fresh session. It was a completely fresh stage layout, I think even some changes in the band, right? Yeah, yeah, so basically, absolutely. Yeah. It, was, it was like a white paper and you could just design um, as much as possible from the audio yeah. perspective at least. Yeah, there was, uh, there was a, a, a kind of a standstill or a scratch from the old system. Mm. Um, and uh, which was on a different desk and everything really, really basic, to be honest. But um, as we switched um, equipment, we switched everything. And also um, a new bass player um, was coming into a band, another additional guitar player. So it was more sounds, more informations, more frequency based uh, overlays that has to be placed. And uh, for that, the Clang unit is for me the go-to tool to keep everything on the right place and getting a clean and um, focused sound. Perfect, yeah. Music to my ears. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the setup there? Um, if I, I visited you quite a while ago at the production. I'm not sure if it was all the time the same thing. You're using an, an SD12 there, right? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the basic setup was that uh, the front of house guy um, uh, Ingo at um, uh, at the last tour used an, an Avid console, mm -hmm. and we uh, wanted to get rid of two stage boxes and so on and a lot of stuff to carry and to set up. So we used the Avid stage box as the main input stage box, and I was just getting a MIDI stream and um, uh, straight into the ST12. And from there on, I was doing my mixes for six musicians, one guest singer, and for the backline crew. Um, so in total, I had eight mixes on two units, so uh, 40 in channels on four mixes um, uh, for each unit. And um, and I'm also uh, what I really love about the hardware um, Clang Fabric is that I can use it as a converter. So the Clang Fabric was my breakout box because I didn't have a stage box on my console. So I used it uh, as a breakout box to feeding all of my PSM 1000 uh, in your transmitters. All right. Okay. So, so, I'm, so sending, I'm, I'm sending this, the signal um, two times into the unit um, uh, and back and forth. And um, so it's really, really stable system. I had none issue at all. So it worked for the whole summer, no matter if it if it was uh, hot like hell, or freezing cold uh, <laughs> during some uh, winter shows. So mm -hmm. oh, nice. really, okay. really reliable. Nice, nice. Um, and uh, the band was was the band fully on on in ears, or were there any wedges or subs or side fills? Um, we used. Um, they were all on in ears. Um, the the um, uh, the drummer is also using a butt shaker, and I'm placed some subwoofers on stage because right. okay. from from my um, experience, um, it, just using in ears with no subs, even in our days with the uh, cardioid sub from the house setups, with almost no sub informations on stage, you need to fill up the sound to get in body frequencies. 
to keep your body moving and uh, then even the in-ear sound is getting better and better okay, so it's so a huge, it's a huge part of my setup to getting the sub information right on stage okay i see would you even do that when you would have a setup where the pa is actually giving some some information on the stage no. or do you just do it when you need it basically right yeah exactly okay um just for example, with the um, with Abby, um, the Iranian singer, um, we're playing all over the world, and it's almost impossible to getting um, um, subwoofers on stage because uh, of the infrastructure and the supplier and so on, so on, so on. It would be a lot of talking. And uh, what I'm doing over there is uh, we have our own um, PA system engineer, and uh, when he's tuning the PA, we're going over on specific uh, spots on stage and see how much bass information he could get me for my in-ear sound uh, from the front of house sound that we all happy at the end. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool, okay, all right. Speaking of, of Abby, um, it's, it's actually a production that we both know. Um, I had the, the pleasure to fill in a couple of times for you for that production. Um, it's, 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 an, it's a quite interesting situation because uh, the band is, I mean, has various sizes basically of musicians <laughs> on stage depending on where and um and which 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 venue they are playing um but one one relatively special thing is that uh, you and monitor world are only mixing for the main artist only for the singer and the rest of the band is um mixing themselves with just clang app right yeah that's true um, which uh, makes it for me really really easy because um also, on that point, I'm really straightforward. So the singer is uh, paying all the bills, mm. and so he is the most important person on the on the show. And even with the, or, or especially with the with those I Iranian um, community, um, which is really really different that some our Western, let's say Western artists are doing, because mm. it's a lot of a lot of emotions are involved. And really deep, deep emotions about the country and um, and all of that, which will happen at the moment in Iran. And there's a lot of lot of energy in the room. And um, for me, with Abby, it's just my goal to make him happy. And mm. I can feel it when it makes click in his head, and he is really the the he switched on, and he is taking all the energy from the audience and giving it back to the audience during this, his singing and uh, his lyrics. And um, then there is a really, really kind of, help me. Um, There's a good dynamic, I guess, between the audience. Yeah. 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 Very cool, and okay. Um, and with, with the artists, I mean, with the, with the band on stage, um, I think the size can be from six people to, what's the biggest? The biggest I had was, I guess, 14. 14, okay. Yeah. So uh, there, there is uh, basically there are two two bands, an European and an American bands, and uh, sometimes some of the musicians are switching around. So mm. sometimes the the um, American keyboarder will come to Europe and will play with a European band, or we had one show with a drummer from the U.S. Who was flying in for a European uh, for the European band, and uh, also that gives gives a, a, a whole different dynamic and energy on stage just mm -hmm. by, by switching one or two people. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we it could be a really really small band for also a small club. We played a, a, a six by five meter stage in Spain, mm -hmm. or or we have in Dubai uh, thirty by twenty meter stages. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really, really, really um, huge band. Mm -hmm. It could be happen on stage. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but, but be, since um, uh, since the musicians are interchanging a lot and the sizes are changing a lot, I guess the the setup that you have there has to be very flexible. So you can just easily yeah. tune it to the to the current setup. Um, is yeah. there? Do you have any any issues with that, or are there any any things that you always have to keep in mind where you need a lot of time, or is it relatively easy in the way that you prepared it? Um, also, to be honest, for the first show when we're doing a leg of a tour, it's always um, you need an hour, one and a half hour to prepare everything, mm -hmm. because the um, also the American setup is way different on 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 every side than the European from the um, 
input channels to musicians to uh, which musician getting his signal um, uh, over which medium so is it all hardwired or is it wireless or the drummer getting a hardwire feed and so on so on i see so um we have to, or i have to reprogram the, the dante setup and um, bring everything back together mm -hmm. but at the end it always works Mm. Uh, which makes me happy and gives me a, <laughs> um, a confident feeling. Mm. Um, sometimes it takes a uh, takes a bit of time, but uh, at the end, uh, we or let's say we didn't over, miss yeah. miss a show. Yeah, mm. that's not. Yeah, and also yeah. also for me to get back into the system mm. because it's it's could be really really complex. We have a lot of um, clunk weller to feeding all the musicians. Because mm -hmm. they uh, are, f are fixed on their on their stage um, uh, positions, because mm -hmm. the singer is the singer and he is working around, walking around, and all the others are on fixed positions. So they're all hardwired, mm -hmm. and to um, uh, and for us to because we have just flying, we're flying all over, all around and and to every show, to have a completely set up with us, it's a huge huge benefit. And the Klangquelle is the one of the main components of that. Right. How many are you using there? Um, we're using three. Mm -hmm. So uh, each of uh, the Klangquelle can handle four musicians, mm -hmm. and we're using three of them and uh, just um, extend those headline that headphone lines to the musicians. That's it. So the complete setup for the complete band is done in. 20 minutes, 15 minutes, I don't know. Perfect, so yeah. it's really, really fast and easy. That makes it much easier. And I guess one, one part of the dec decision to go to, to, to a hardwired solution with Clankwell is, was probably that you're hopping around in so many countries that uh, RF management might be quite tricky every now and then, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, and to, uh, to getting all the equipment. Because oh. I remember one, one show in Armenia, we had to fly in a PSM 1000 from LA because there are no PSM 1000 in Armenia, they are not available. And we also flew in an, um, a lighting desk and to doing that every time, um, it would be a really, really a big cost uh, <laughs> intensive um, issue. And, and you're absolutely right to getting all the frequency um, uh, frequencies uh, correct. Um, mm. It's sometimes a pain in the ass and it's yeah. And sometimes it's not manageable. Mm. Even when the artist is just two meters away from uh, from the antenna, you still get drop out because mm. you're in the middle of nowhere, nowhere or you're in the middle of everything. Mm. Uh, it, it depends. And um, so we decided to get in the most of the of the musicians uh, on hardwired because they don't even walk around. So why not? Okay. Keep nice. it easy and simple, mm. and we and we and reliable. Which is for me the most important um, part. Actually, of speaking of reliable, uh, we just got a question in here from um, Malte. Ah. How is your backup concept? <clears throat> um, can I think we will talk about a little bit of that in, in, in detail later? But uh, do you have like a quick yeah. answer for that? Uh, my quick answer is uh, keep my fingers crossed. Um, uh, <laughs> I have Hashtag some... YOLO. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I have always one spare in-ear um, transmitter and receiver, which I can patch easily everything to it. And and also, to be honest, um, we just uh, I'm always saying that we're just moving air at the end. So if we have to stop on a show because something really uh, a minor issue is is coming up, then we have to stop. That's it. Okay. It's just it's just a show, and we're just moving air. Mm. Uh, no one will die. Uh, so um, <laughs> that's that's a very very good point. Um, yeah. But I did did it happen a lot? Uh, basically, um, especially when you were traveling and flying, and you know cases were bumping around in the airplane and that stuff. Did you have did you have uh, a, a lot of problems or something like that? No, to be honest, not. Great. Um, what I'm always doing is I'm taking um, taking care of the uh, in-ear headphones of the artist. Mm -hmm. So I keep them in my backpack um, on flights um, because um, whatever happens, we have his in-ears with us. Uh, all the rest, it's manageable. Mm -hmm. um, 
And really, uh, especially, I have to say that, uh, especially the Clank stuff is built like a tank. Uh, I, not one issue in five years, to be honest. And to hear. Um, what we're doing on on shows, just like for Max Giesinger, uh, for an example, is that we are sending uh, mixes back and forth. So if one of the soundboards will crash, um, the other side have a backup mix from the other position. So we can help uh, each other out um, to, uh, if there is a minor issue, to maybe just mm. move on a little bit. All right, yeah. <laughs> Um, by the way, just jumping back to the to the Max Giesinger production, um, you mentioned that at the beginning the front of house was uh, using an Avid board, right? Yes, true. Okay. Yeah. Um, you said at the beginning, uh, did that change or? Yeah, it actually um, uh, we changed it because uh, Ingo was um, switching with all of his uh, productions to uh, the Digico side, mm -hmm. which makes it for me and for us easier. Um, uh, really, one of the really big benefits was the um, was the new 32-bit uh, input and output cards, mm -hmm. with the sounding really so so good. And um, we had our production rehearsal, um, and it was just like day and night, mm -hmm. to be honest, to hearing the different preamps and uh, also some of the musicians are recognized it, that it sounds different. And I used the same desk setup, the same layout, so no changes, just a different preamp. Mm -hmm. And um, for us, it was a natural next step to uh, moving on. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, understood. Um, let's let's cover one, one last aspect of your personal path, basically, in the, into the industry. So we basically stopped at a couple of years ago. Um, so we did <laughs> your like your early history. Um, so, um, we actually work together much closer now, um, because not only were you one of the first Klang users in Germany, um, but a few years ago you joined uh, a company called United Brands, which is a uh, pro audio distribution in Germany. Um, yeah. And after you did that, um, still doing live shows, you know, like 50-50, I guess, or I don't know how much, how, how the time is spent there. Um, you actually um, uh, got in touch with us again and asked, hey, shouldn't we talk about a distribution together? Um, and yeah. for, for, for me, that was basically back then a no-brainer, just knowing that uh, I would have a very experienced Klang user there and someone who is, um, you know, um, ah, now, now I'm, losing, I'm losing the right word for it, but basically, <laughs> th there's a nice German word for it, Überzeugungstäter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so basically, you 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 were convinced of Klang. You just implemented it in pretty much every production that you that you had and that you could do. Um, yeah. So actually, having someone to sell it who's actually a user and not just a number cruncher um, was a very very good good point for us. So um, just just that side here, really happy to be working with you on on that side. And um, it's something yep. we can we can really feel and really see. And whenever we do stuff together and we do seminars together, um, it's really nice to see how much trust you enjoy from uh, your peers, from 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 all the colleagues in our industry. Um, so that brings us basically to the to the next uh, few topics that I that I had in mind here. I'm actually prepared. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have no idea how that. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about a little bit of the, the skill sets that, that you acquired over the years and that basically keep you in a safe position um, in, in the market basically for yourself as a monitor engineer. Um, let's, let's first start with, with your front of house side, even if you didn't do it for, for a while. Um, how do you feel is the, the interaction between monitors on stage and front of house? Um, did you feel a difference between different monitor setups or different monitor engineers um, for you as a front of house person? Um, yeah, yes. Um, there is. There are some um, difficult um, or different, different situations with different people, for sure. Um, but as far as I remember, I did a lot of monitor from front of house. And um, that's also where I learned a lot of signal and signal tuning. 
because mm. um, I'm uh, rather than um, trying to getting sounds right for uh, in the channel EQ for the for the PA system. I just tune the PA system that I like it and keep the channel EQs as flat as possible or as natural sounding and possible to fit in a musician's from the front of house desk. Mm -hmm. So um, this is what I'm now also doing in my monitor worlds. I'm always trying to keep everything um, sounding as natural as possible mm -hmm. and um, tuning all the rest which is coming after the channel processing. Okay. So to keep that the basic setup uh, even and close, uh, or, or just uh, just easy spread out. And um, sometimes it's it it can be hard or difficult with uh, other monitor engineers um, and other uh, ways of doing things. Um, but I have the feeling, also Germany. I, I think there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of issues with those two worlds are sometimes fighting against <laughs> each other. So I have to say it out loud now, mm. um, uh, which is on um, on um, uh, which I which I don't like at, to be honest. So um, we are all sitting in the same boat. Um, if the front of house guy wants nice and easy and crispy, clean, dynamic signals uh, the musician on stage has to be happy with his monitor sound and so on so it's a circling around of of emotions and of energy of course, so it's yeah. at the end it's better and easier to um to pulling on one side of a rope than on two uh, and just two opposite ends yeah, uh, yeah. i see exactly. so so um what what you're saying basically is um, to just recap that um, the more confident the musicians are on stage, the better the signals that are coming into the board, no matter if uh, the monitor board or front of house board, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Got it. Okay. That, that's that's also uh, that's always what I'm trying to achieve is to to making a musician happy because um, this is my job. This this is um, what I'm getting paid for. To be honest, it's not to uh, making the best sounding snare drum. Uh, it's just to keeping those guys over there happy, and they then they they have a good time, and um, and I'm using all the tools and everything to achieving that. Mm. So, and I don't care about the rest, to be honest. I don't care about the desk, microphones, um, room situations. Uh, so I'm always trying to have different um, issue plans. If uh, plan A is uh, going to the wrong direction, I will always have plan B to uh, save the situation. Mm -hmm. And um, this is just by experience over the years. That, that makes hope. a lot of sense, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, so far it seems it's, it's working out quite nicely. Um, yeah. just, just one thing. Um, I, I feel, and from, from, from conversations with many, many colleagues on, 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 uh, and, and monitor engineers and musicians and all that stuff, um, I feel that, that basically there are three main skills which are relevant for, for, for monitor engineers. Uh, feel free to, to contradict me. Um, I would say that, that one part is audio skills, but as you just said, that's not necessarily the, the biggest part of, of what you need. Oh. <laughs> um, then of course you need some business skills to you know, advance yourself in a, in a, in a <clears throat> market or in a situation. Um, but probably one of the most important skills would be people skills. So how you act, how you appear, how you talk to the artists and all that stuff. Do, do you think that is um, more or less accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, for me, the most important is the, uh, 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 the, the personal uh, people skills. Because um, how I'm acting and how I behave on an on a show, it will translate to the musician or take over to the musician. So if I'm frantic and all and not sure what I'm doing, um, everybody else will recognize it. And uh, then um, uh, there is a, a high percentage that the thing is going down. Um, no one of us uh, want that. So <laughs> what I'm always trying to do is just be common easy um, and to be in control of situations okay. and uh, yeah that, that's a very good point um, 
So we, we, of course, we have a lot of friends and colleagues in common. Um, we even have been working on some of the same productions, even if we have never worked at the same time. Um, <laughs> sure. But, <laughs> but, yeah, we, um, we, but, but uh, we missed it. We so, uh, oh, uh, yes, in, uh, true. a couple of weeks ago in Saudi Arabia, um, yeah. you should do the front of house, uh, but unfortunately, yeah, you can't, uh, you couldn't make it. So. No, no, that was, that was too bad. That would have been nice. That would have been a premiere. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. no, but, but what I, what I keep hearing when I, when I talk to people, uh, who have been working with you or who, who are working with you, um, one very, very big, um, thing always gets mentioned that everybody's really impressed by your working speed. So I'm not just talking about coiling cables or something like that, but actually how fast you, <laughs> how fast you can react on requests or when, when something goes wrong or something unexpected happens and all that stuff. Is there any, is there any trick um, behind that? Do you have any, any, um, any methods or concepts how to be as fast as possible? Um, yes. And okay. it is to keep everything as simple as possible. So my desk setup is really, really simple. So I don't go through uh, different uh, paths or groups and blah, 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 and sending stuff back and blah, 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 um, in the in the wheeling, in the mixing stage. Um, um, so in the audio distribution stage, it can be really, really complicating what I'm doing, um, but also just to, to getting the best out of the equipment. But... Um, when it comes to the point of um, doing really the actual monitors on a mixing, I really have uh, my specialized layout. Mm -hmm. So what I'm always doing nowadays on a Digico console is just using banks for, um, for signal groups and for musician groups um, that I can really, really fast access to different to different signals. So I have one bank just with drums, the other one with the musical instruments, just like everything with hats, uh, which are equipped with strings, mm -hmm. just bass guitar, um, regular guitars, then one just with keyboards also. Uh, so signals were really broad and um, uh, frequency wide range signals mm -hmm. um, to access them fast and I have um, some signals um, a couple of times on the surface on different spots so let's say the main singer is on my setup uh, four or five times on, on, on different layers and banks to getting quick access to that mm -hmm. so it's most of the time it's just by um, laying out your console and your setup easy mm -hmm. um, and to keep it simple as, pos as possible so um, most of the time, my uh, guitar EQs and keyboard EQs are totally flat, mm -hmm. and I'm using I'm using other um, tools to um, tweak them, and then it's really really easy and fast to really re react and okay. experiences. Yeah. I guess that that oh. helps as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but that's an interesting point that you that you keep the system as simple as as possible. Um, now I have to, to ask a probably unusual question from, from a Clang perspective coming. Um, but um, I mean, since, since a bit more than a year, we have the full integration of Clang into digital console. So now you're anyways 100% in your workflow, so you don't have to change anything with Clang. But you were working before four years with Clang uh, without an, a, any desk integration as an external yeah. device. Um, so you said you keep it as simple as possible. Um, but you had an external device for your, your monitor mixes. Um, how was that relationship? Was that basically, did it slow you down? Did it, of course, I mean, it's probably a different, different, um, different place where you have to do something, but did you notice that you got slower through that or did uh, you no. in a different way? Uh, to me, it's the opposite. Um, I'm using always the tool which brings me on the fastest way to my goal at the moment. And even in nowadays, I'm using the iPad as well. So I'm using desk and the iPad. Uh, sometimes I have one mix open on the iPad um, with a quick access immediately and not to switching around on the desk side. Um, nice. Also, also um, with Abby, um, for me, one of the biggest... Um, of the biggest... Um, uh, uh, can't find a word. 
Say okay, what I'm doing, <laughs> uh, what, what I'm doing with Abby on the on the uh, at the sound check, I'm uh, right on his side. So the biggest benefit, I got it. The biggest benefit for me <laughs> of uh, with uh, with um, uh, with Clang is that on the um, as I said on the sound check, I can be really right next to him. So standing on his position, feeling the bass um, uh, reactions, feeling feeling also what he's hearing because i'm hearing his mix we have we have the same earpieces um hearing almost on the same level mm. um he's uh, just a little bit louder than i'm um, used to wearing headphones mm. and uh, to being with him and have really closed uh communication mm. and and when he says ah, i need a little bit more clarity in my vocals i have to jump to the desk doing the changes and going back to him. Mm. And uh, so I'm using, even nowadays, both uh, devices. And um, to me, it's an also, that's maybe one of the backup systems mm. um, um, because I'm uh, also on, I remember one show in Cyprus, I forgot my iPad at home and I had to mix one show with Abby completely on my iPhone and it also worked <laughs> out. So, okay. Um, so um, yeah, it's it uh, most yeah mo most of the times it's just in our head uh, the problem and um, I'm always trying to to get quick and easy as possible to my goals um, no matter what I'm doing. Perfect. Okay, that sounds very good. Um, by the way, I see that there is a couple of questions coming in. Um, I would um, since they are not directly on our topic right now. Um, Bubis and me will talk about a few more aspects um, of uh, his work and his strategies and his workflows. And after that, we will have plenty of time for all kinds of questions. So just stay with us, uh, gather those questions. Feel free to type them already in the comments. Um, we will definitely get to all of them. Promise. Yes. All right. So, um, I, of course, I would love to take a look at some of your uh, setups uh, in Klang. But before we do that, um, do you have any, any interesting tips and tricks for your fellow monitor engineers um, when it comes to, to ambience mics? Because I know that you are using a relatively unusual uh, favorite ambience mic choice. Yes, uh, yes I do. Um, over the years I was um, trying and testing a lot of mics and see what other people are doing. And so I used shotgun mics, condenser mics, on T-bars, on different positions, and so on, so on. And at the end, um, I was um, thinking and talking to myself just, just to use an, an SM57. Mm -hmm. Because it's one, or it's one of the natural sounding mics on the market. It's reliable. You can find it everywhere on the world. If it's um, on uh, nowadays um, um, on some festivals, um, there is a lot of rain during the day. Mm. So to me, it doesn't matter if an SM57 getting wet. So I'm generally going to the supplier and ask him, I'm pretty sure you have S uh, um, the 57 in your, um, uh, in your collection. Can I please borrow two or four of them? Mm. And um, so... It doesn't matter where I'm on tour uh, in the world. I'm always uh, have my, and this is also one of my signatures in my in ear sound is the ambience, mm. and um, so nearly fifty percent of my work is done, mm. um, and it's there. I, and I, I actually have to admit that I mean, since I I was uh, working on your sessions and your your your. Uh, your setups with your files a couple of times already. I have to admit that when I saw it the first time, I was like frowning a little bit. What? Why? Why <laughs> is there a 57 in there? But then, you know, when I just uh, listened into the mixes, it just all made sense, you know? So um, it's it's definitely a thing to try. And that's, that's I guess, one of the, the, the really interesting things. Would you, would you recommend to not go by what is generally accepted to be the tool to use? Um, but rather, would you just say, try it, if it sounds good, it is good. Even if a lot of people tell you, you shouldn't do it. 
Absolutely, because uh, every everybody is feeling um, and hearing sound differently, mm. and um, that's also what I'm what I'm trying to achieve is uh, also for myself to be confident. Is um, what would I respect to hear? And um, you told me one day with one of of your seminars that one of the most important um, things in, in, in hearing is the eye. So, uh, what you are seeing is what your brain is expecting to hear. Mm. And if this is not matching together, uh, you have a huge problem. Mm. And this is also what I'm doing with my, uh, with my ambient mics is I'm placed them on the artist's ear high. Mm -hmm. So I pull them really, really up that really what, um, that it's on the same level that his ears are. So it's it's also another trick of to getting a natural sound, mm. and not to hearing on um, maybe the one feet above the stage um, or uh, some of the first row uh, girls, people, whatever, <laughs> and you're hearing with a condenser mic every uh, uh, little noise and switches and speeches, which is unnatural, mm. which is really one of the unnatural things you can ever uh, imagine. It's um, and also what I'm doing. Also, what I'm doing is uh, with my effect returns. I'm using a lot of uh, high pass and low pass filtering because also what is really natural. Um, if a signal is far away from your from yourself, then uh, it's losing bass signal, uh, bass um, and uh, high frequency informations, and it's just a mid range which you can hear. And this is also what I'm trying to get him back into the sound with the ambience mics, which are not crisp and clear because it's unnatural. And also with the uh, with my effect returns. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I see. So you're using the ambience mics actually not just for information for some some clapping or something, but just actually to get like a, a real ambience and just to get yeah. like an impression or an interpretation of what is what is yeah of the of the room yeah. yeah of the room also yeah. Cool. And okay. um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm also doing is it's because when it, when the the ambient mics are so high place uh, on on the sides of, of the stage, they're most of the times uh, really near the PA. And what I'm also doing is uh, using dynamic EQs. Mm -hmm. um, so when the PA is um, playing hard and loud, the dynamic EQ is scooping out of the mid and bass uh, frequencies. That it's not getting muddy in the ears, mm. and it's just a, just also mid informations. And when the song is the song is over and PA uh, um, is off, um, the whole sound spectrum is getting back, and you're getting a full audience sound and a full a room reaction okay. sound. Nice. And are you just using the the dynamic EQs uh, for from from your from the board for that, or do you have yes. any special tools for that? No, just from the board. Okay. Cool. Again. Keep it simple. It's always there. Um, uh, 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 the Englishman give us that tool on every channel and every bus. So <laughs> why I shouldn't use it? To be honest, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, but speaking of possibilities in the board, um, do you usually um, do some processing on the on the on the uh, auxes that are sent to the musicians? Do you do like some bus compression, yep. EQing, or something? Um, what I'm doing uh, nowadays, I'm Two years ago or one year ago, I had a lot of wave plugins uh, involved in my setup, also on um, on input channels, but also on uh, mixes. Um, and on mixes, I'm getting uh, rid of that, um, not because of the latency or something, but it's just a feeling. It was a feeling decision. Mm -hmm. And what I'm now doing is taking the Digico Audio Enhancer and... Um, uh, take that from the FX um, unit and place that in every in every uh, mix as an insert, mm. and that will polish the sound. Um, and when I'm just have to add a little bit more clarity to the sound, it's easier to boost up the the high frequency bands just um, just a little bit. Mm. Um, and it sounds natural than to using a phase shifting AQ with a broad um, sheltering filter. Okay, yeah, that, that makes total sense, yeah. All right, cool.
Um, so, but but did, did you notice any any problems when you did all kinds of processing, like the saturation or the the, the um, um, uh, compression or whatever, um, on the Klang mixes? Does it have a negative no. input on them? No, not at all. To me, it's cool. easier, uh, or or it's a it's it's a benefit to uh, using those mastering um, processing with Clang mixes um, because the, okay. the, the dynamic range is different on a Clang mix. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found out that also with the, especially with the audio enhancer, it fits perfectly together. Mm -hmm. And it's for me, it's for me an, a tool I'm using all the time. And also again, it, it's there. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So, um... Do you want to show us a little bit of your uh, of a Klang setup that you did? Because I think that yeah. um, me at least, and probably a couple of people who are watching, are very curious on um, how it looks, how you place uh, signals and all that stuff. So yeah, sure. Let me just switch over. Let's. Oops. Okay, I will let's see. So there we go. There we nice. go. Yes. Um, so this is um, a setup from um, the Epi production, mm -hmm. and um, he is at, at the uh, at that production. He is a mix number one, which I'm uh, normally not doing, to be honest. Um, so it's also a rule of mine to keeping everything in a right um, a line and direction on the board. So when the drums coming first, my first FX uh, or effect is drum effect. My first uh, aux, uh, aux that I'm sending is for the drummer. And also there will be the first mix on the, um, on the clan fabric will be the drummer's mix. So to keep it easy is as simple, uh, as, simple as, uh, as you could. And also the first transmitter on the in-ear system is for the drummer. Mm -hmm. So that it's uh, just constantly moving from left to right during okay, the whole so a blind logic basically that you have in there absolutely okay yeah cool and i'm lazy so um <laughs> it's maybe maybe the main reason why i'm um, coming up with that uh so uh, this is unusual to um having abby's mix on the first position um but uh, what you can see here is uh, we have a total of um, or well, we had um, two years ago a total of uh, 48 inputs. And nowadays, it's expand a little bit. So I have to send two groups into Clang, but it's uh, even better than uh, everything else. Mm -hmm. So my basic setup at the moment is um, I have the kick in on one channel and the snare drum, just the top microphone. So I'm not a fan of um, sending um, snare top and bottom into Clang. It doesn't make sense to me, to be honest. Uh, also with the kick drum, I'm just sending in the kick, um, the kick in a mic, and not also a mix of kick in and kick out. And the phase relationship will always change in doing dynamic changes of the drummer's um, uh, playing style. So Quick it question. doesn't make is that, sense. Is that class yes. specific, or do you generally not 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 use kick in and kick out? In a, in a I'm general. I'm generally not using it. Ah, so okay. most of the times on channel four, let's say, which okay. is on the front of house mix, the snare button, there will be, uh, in my world, there will be another acoustic guitar or uh, some vocals or something, whatever has to fit over there. Mm. Um, I also keeping that as simple as possible. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So um, what I'm doing is the color coding um, to make it for me, um, because I'm lazy, easier to find things. And it's always the same, for me, it's always the same um, um, uh, layout. Mm -hmm. So I have the toms, um, the overhead, which is a stereo channel. Um, there is a band cue, which coming from Ableton, because in Abby's world, everything is live. So there is no backing tracks, no uh, really click track. It's just a click track to getting into the song and for um, time code. And we have an Abbey cue just to um, to cue him on two songs. That's it. And what I'm also doing is I'm sending the effect returns into Clang. Um, with that band and production, to me, it sounded so much better when it's not on the board. Uh, and it's also in, in the Clang world um, to moving it around. 
So then we move on with uh, uh, string instruments, which is the bass, the guitar, which is coming from an from a pedal board, um, a line level, uh, no amp on stage, um, an acoustic guitar, and the red signals are some pianos and keyboards. So on some shows we have three keyboard players, um, um, which is uh, a lot of frequency information. Mm -hmm. And it's not so easy to really keep all of that um, really focused, also for the singer, because there's a lot of melody changes and also on some um, tracks, on some songs, the main melodies are um, switching be between musicians. So, um, so everything so, basically has to be there at all times. Ex exactly. Yeah. Somehow fit into the mix. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but not all of them have to be present at the same time. So it's also um, now the experience by the musicians, also with Clang, because they're all using the Clang world, um, and they've playing um, a little bit more accurate. Um, In terms of dynamic, you mean? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And also with, also with sounds, um, so with um, uh, frequency sounds. So we have the four um, keyboards, piano, whatever. Uh, then we have uh, saxophone and flute, which is played by Peter. He has his own effects because he was jealous of Abby to have his own effects. So he gets <laughs> also his own ones. And um, we just uh, supplier, so um, I want to make him happy. Mm. Um, on some shows, we have um, four additional horn players from the US, from Los Angeles. Um, and what I'm doing over there is just I'm mixing them uh, in the board and sending out a bus to the client because I'm running out of channels. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just, or they're not available on every show or not a part of, of the crew on every show. So I decided to keep them on the desk. And well, that's an interesting point. So so you, you, you created a stereo bus for the horns and you just yes. pan them in that stereo bus? Yeah, exactly. And like so this, I'm, when you put them in Klang, they are actually panned like individual yeah. signals basically right exactly yeah Smart uh, on okay. there and also they're getting their mixes not in clang um also on the board so getting regular aux mixes on the board so um there are pre um fader mixes on the auxes and i can adjust with the master faders the post signal into the clang world um so i have um, um best of both worlds to keep them happy with no changes and um, just doing the changes for the Clang world and mm -hmm. spread them out in the spectrum and um, that's it. Okay, uh, that's a good, yeah. good strategy actually, really nice. Cool. Yeah, then um, can, we, can we talk about um, the positioning of the signals? Um, yeah, I, ju I just, just want to finish up with the, with the oh. main singer because he is uh, the loudest. Um, <laughs> Obviously, let me let uh, me move us out of the way here because we're oh. covering. Okay, so now now we see the right side of the screen. Yes, this is this is uh, Abby's mic, um, and he got his uh, the two effect returns, which is a uh, emulation of a precasti and um, an A. Um, then we have um, a Mona. Um, she's playing the percussions, uh, also on a percussion bus. So I'm doing the same as for the horns, um, also for her. Um, to doing the mixes, um, uh, her mix on the board and sending a bus into the um, into the clang. And there are my crowd mics, so the audience and the talkbacks. And to me, the most important thing in um, doing monitors is communication. So uh, we always have to keep up communication. Um, this is one of my main jobs when I'm doing my stuff. Because we have uh, my talkback, Ushertz, is the MD for the bands, and he is always um, talking between songs. And if there is a change or something, the front of house talkback microphone and Farshid, which is Abby's uh, son, um, and the management, and they're talking also during the show. So it's also what I'm decided to put those signals also into the Clang world, which is. Um, uh, can be really, really um, necessarily for uh, show ending. Okay. And for positions, as you ask for, <laughs> um, we're switching to, oh no, I have to switch over a window. There we go. So it looks like this, mm -hmm. which uh, looks like and uh, not uh, sounds like a big mess, but 
when we're seeing on the on the drums, it's really basic. What I'm doing is always I try to keep the kick and the snare uh, right in front. Mm-hmm. Um, on the three D image, um, the hi hat where it's pers- where it is. Mm-hmm. The overheads, obviously, left and right. And what I'm always doing is putting the drums behind the singer. Mm-hmm. So it's, for me, it's just an an information tool, mm-hmm. a, a rhythmic information tool. It has to be there, but it don't, don't have to bother you. I mix them always really, really loud. Um, because what I'm really, uh, what I'm, hating is uh, when um, you're having an, an irregular beat and there is an, an, uh, an bar of drum fill or whatever and the sound disappears because it's too uh, it's uh, too quiet in the mix and so on so on so on so you want to so keep the energy I'm, up absolutely yeah. to me my goal is to uh, or what i'm what i'm doing is just distributing energy at mm-hmm. the end and the toms is one of my tools to keep up with the energy from the drama side so I keep them in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, with the guitar world, the bass is a little bit out of center to making a little bit more space on the bass frequency side on the uh, headphones, on the mm-hmm. earpiece. Um, the guitar is where it's positioned. Um, at the Abbey show, it's at front um, regularly. Um, I would have put it behind because he's also standing behind him. But um, uh, Manfred, um, Manfred Chan is playing a lot of um, nice and important lines, so they have to be there. Mm. And some I'm experimented with behind, and um, came up with a solution to keep it at front. Sure, and that's that's always. I mean, that's that's an interesting thing. When whenever I talk to fresh Klang users. Um, they always ask, where do I have to position stuff? And that's something I want to make clear here. So this is how, how Bubis is using it in this situation. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bubis, but um, you found those positions by listening to them and not by pre-thinking about where you should put stuff, right? Absolutely. What I'm always doing is I'm, I'm finding the position where it sounds good. Mm-hmm. That's it. So I'm, and that's I'm, yeah, absolutely. On in in every sense, on the desk. Also, when I'm soloing something and whatever, I'm just always listening through clang, mm. always. So I hear the position and where it's uh, where it's layout. So I'm fiddling a, a lot doing shows uh, with the hi hat mm. because it makes huge difference um, if it's placed over there or it's placed over there. It sounds mm. so different, and you have to find the right position for that. Mm. And and uh, no matter what, just go and um, look and search for the right position because mm. that's what we're here for. So. That's it. Yeah. By the way, one 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 interesting thing that I noticed is that the, yeah, or that as you mentioned, that the bass is not centered. That is in stereo. That would be pretty hard to do, actually. Yeah. Or do you would you do that in a stereo mix as well? Um, maybe a, a little bit less than than I have it over here. Mm. Um, Actually, I don't know why it's labeled with a five. Hmm. I have to overthink that. High five okay. to the bassist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> for, our, for our Dutch friend. Uh, um, I just, I just also, it was a try and error thing uh, on that setup to, um, um, to, to keep it just a little bit out of center. And it sounded better to me. And um, that's it. Okay. So nice. um, when we're moving on to the keyboards, um, there is where uh, everything is really, really getting messy uh, because we have, uh, Michael is playing a lot of um, organ and um, organic sounds. So he's one of the main sound parts, but he's playing more of the background. So he's placed direct uh, through the head. Then we have uh, also a piano position, which is more of up front but left right um, um, balanced out um, marine or which also can be ushered from the US is playing more of the of the melody high frequency melody flute sounds strings pads so it has to be there but with an um, direction mm-hmm. into it and um, uh, Goli is playing a lot of background sounds on a Nord keyboard. Um, 
and um, also um, I think she also uses a, a laptop with sounds on it but they are not so picky those sounds so they are not bothering um, uh, frequency wise so it's also on the on the same left and right level and just playing around with it some some days quick quick question for that do you use elevation yes. a lot um, uh, um, not not that much, much on the yeah. keyboards no um, sometimes uh, it depends also what what we are getting also with the, with the piano most of the times the piano we are getting is um, or sometimes we have a really actually um, a really really acoustic piano on stage mm -hmm. which is which can be really really difficult with a loud band and a loud PA system um, and you've been in the middle of nowhere and just got a uh, Steinway um, uh, uh, grand piano on stage and you and you imagine uh, uh, yeah okay we have to deal with it or sometimes it's just a keyboard or whatever mm. so um with the guitars i'm doing a, a lot of elevation experiments mm. um because also um because it's it is a frequency dynamic instrument it sounds uh, different when it's placed more upwards or mm -hmm. downwards so sure, it's yeah. getting really interesting and with the drums also i try to get the snare in a position where it's really hammering mm -hmm. uh, and then bring it down in the mix just a little bit but the information is on the right place so good point for the keyboards it's most of the time it's it's really really flat because the sounds are so changing so um, uh, uh, dramatically mm -hmm. it's to me, it doesn't make sense to really doing the, a lot of movement over there. Okay, yeah, for, for the horns, uh, we have the horn bus, which is going through the head. Sometimes I have it also behind Abby, sometimes at the front. It depends on the venue, to be honest. If it's a um, really big, big, bright um, and, uh, and wide venue, or it's more small hall, um, the position will change. Mm -hmm. Because of the natural back um, back feedback from the instruments on stage, uh, and also into the ambience mics, mm -hmm. and um, I'm also experimenting with Peter's positions with the flute and the saxophone, um, and with his effects. Sometimes um, his effects, are, as you can see, there are not that intelligent uh, looking placed but it sounds good well that's, so that's what it's all about now, yeah, yeah exactly. they're coming now so from that side just a little bit so it gets a lot of depth into that um on this axis mm -hmm. and leveling wise it's the flute of course he uses a biodynamic 201 um dynamic um there, dynamic microphone which for me it's the best flute mic ever and um, so you need a lot of gain on that and you have to push it a little bit up uh, to getting more clarity into the sound. Mm -hmm. And for the vocals, obviously, um, Abby is up front mm -hmm. um, and um, the effects, mm, this should be wrong, but uh, okay. Um, the effects are normally behind him. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, what I'm always doing with the vocals is to find the right position on the elevation side. Mm -hmm. There is a spot where the signal is jumping into the head, um, though it feels like. Mm -hmm. And I'm always trying with the main singer, find that spot, place, place the signal over there, and then, it's, uh, then you're ready to go, to be honest. Perfect. Yep. So it's... That's for me. That was the game changer to uh, using Clang, mm -hmm. the vocals. Because all, yeah, it is just uh, to to the elevation to to have access to elevation and to changing sounds and also, I feel like a little bit. Just correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like a little bit of dynamic changes frequency wise when you moving a signal up or down or down a little bit. There's there's no dynamic nah. change actually. Mm. Nah, sorry. But I, okay. it, it can it can appear <laughs> like that because um, the, the the point is and, and that's that's where you're 100 percent on the right track there is that um, once the signals are externalized so they are outside of the head they are in a natural way of hearing for us as human beings 
and that just brings much more the, the brain's capabilities to interpret the sound. And in the same way that, I mean, when, when you're having a conversation with somebody, you would never think, hey, damn, that guy needs a compressor. We only need that if we do like a stereo or speaker mix, right? Yeah. Because yeah. our brain interprets that in a very different way when it's in a natural environment. So I think that's, that's how I would understand um, you, how, you, how you get to the idea that, that it would be a dynamic change. It can definitely appear okay. like that. But I promise yeah. we cho don't change dynamics in there. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I have one group with uh, Miscalicious, uh, which is uh, all of the rest. Mm -hmm. So some of the some of the vocals uh, from the background vocals, all of the um, uh, top back microphones and the crowd mics. Oh wow, that's and... a very wide position for the crowd. Yes, cool. I love it over okay. there. Yeah, uh, nice. because. Uh, also, the mics are really um, uh, wide on stage because mm -hmm. um, we don't have any monitors and um, um, and side fields. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to place the crowd mics really outside of the viewing angle from the audience. Mm -hmm. And they can be 20 meters uh, or even more. So I'm also spread them out in the, in the clang world. And um, there is just a little bit elevation, just see where it sounds good. Okay. Yeah. And cool. basically, for all of that, um, that's it. I hope and think that's an easy setup. <laughs> um, well, it looks, it looks intimidating. Um, but actually, I mean, if you want, you could go to that little minus icon down there and just make the icons a little bit smaller, if you would want to. Can do that. <laughs> but, okay, so um, we already uh, definitely well cracked over the one hour that we tried to stay within. Um, but that was really interesting and we didn't even cover everything that we could probably talk about. Um, I wish we could go on for, for the next two hours. Um, but I see that there's quite a few questions uh, already coming in. So why don't we just yeah. move over to them for now. And let's yeah, see sure. how, uh, what comes there. So let me just find them. Um, okay, so here's one question that was a little bit earlier when we were talking about uh, radio frequencies and all that stuff. Um, do you have any preference on uh, Shore versus Sennheiser or something completely different? Um, yes, uh, I'm always trying to use PSM 1000. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the best sounding um, transmitter and receivers. Um, I love, love the Workbench software. Mm -hmm. um, which is uh, also easy to use, um, uh, quick, lazy guy. So it's quick to set up um, a basic setup uh, or to to uh, to move on. Mm -hmm. So I like the PSM. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, let me see. There's one. It's not a question, but a little shout out from Ralph. Nice to see a face and story from where I got my second Clang 4. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. And look, our friend Parsi is here. Ooh. Hey, Parsi. Hey, Parsi. Um, cool. All right. Um, there's a question here from Carlos. How does limiting yep. or compression in the output of the Klang unit affect the spatial spatiality? Do you have any impression to that? So does it change, you know, the the precision of the placement or the, the overall impression of how real it sounds or how transparent it is? Um, uh, not how I'm mixing, because I'm mixing really uh, thick. So um, everything is always there. And so I don't have um, that big um, dynamic, the dynamic jumps in the system um, that really a compressor or limiter will affect the whole sound. Okay. So. Um, also, with um, um, with Abby, we have some shows where his his um, vocals are really in in inside of the mix, and some they are really loud. It's also a, a, a day um, feeling uh, issue course, behavior. Yeah, yeah. and um, with Max Giesinger, for example, his vocals are really really deep into the mix, so I really can do my compression and mastering on a really good and flexibly inspiring way. And that's also what I'm trying to achieve, to mix everything up 
with a full of energy and a, and a lot of energy in it and um, using a compressor or a limiter as an um, AQ frequency changing device not to and not to keep dynamics really in place. I see. Um, you, you just said that you, you said that you have uh, the voice of Max Giesinger in, in his mix very deep in the mix. Do you mean that it's just not yep. very loud? So it's embedded yes. in the mix? Yes, yeah. exactly. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so some, sometimes some, some keyboard lines or guitar lines are louder than his vocals, and um, um, which is unusual, to be honest, for a singer. But yes. it sounds so good, and yeah. um, he's happy. We're all happy about it. So, so I guess you, you have a relatively isolated position for his vocals. So there's the vocals, and there's nothing in the way of that, and that's why it works. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Even, even, even his guitar is coming from the back. Um, mm. When he's playing his, his own guitar, is coming from the back because his, his amp is positioned over there. So why should not the signal in the claim world uh, should be recognized from, uh, from behind? Makes sense, makes sense. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, oh, here's one from Leila. It's not a question, but uh, she had to leave. Too bad. Oh. See you next time, Leila. <laughs> um, uh, okay, here's another question from Oli. How do you get the buses into Clang? I, I guess the, the oh, question yeah. came when, when you were talking about the layout for the, the Abbey show, and I guess ah. the, the horn bus for example. That's how yeah. I would understand it. Uh, Oli, feel free to send us a follow-up question in case we, we understood it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Ha um, uh, hello, Oli. Um, I'm just sending all of the signals into a bus, uh, taking the output of the bus and uh, sending it to the specific port on the board and using just two channels of it. And that's it. It's just like an, an, um, a regular input signal i'm just sending out an, an stereo signal a bus and um playing a little bit with positions mm -hmm. maybe sometimes with delay delaying that a little bit um de delaying a lot the ambient mics and um okay. and, and trying and and playing around and fiddling around with delays of uh, most of the time i'm using four ambient mics two inner sides two out sides sometimes on a on a small t-bar and just playing with the with the inner mics, with the delay, and the outer mics with a different delay mm -hmm. on it, um, and um, uh, that makes a huge um, sound differences. And yeah, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so so basically, for the bus routing, um, you you just basically just just do do like a subgroup in the board, and the rest yeah. of the routing you basically just do in the board with the possibilities in routing. Yeah, that, exactly. That the yeah. Depending, depending, right. depending the levels, um, straight on the board, um, straightforward, and then just sending out the bus into the Clang world, mm -hmm. um, which is also post fader, and that's it. Okay, got it, got it. Uh, let's see. Oh, we got um, two two other <laughs> identical shoutouts actually here. Really? One, yes. Look, it's it, it, they nearly said the same even. So one from Crazy our friend me. Sia. Oh, hey, Zia. <laughs> so Sia is actually the front of house engineer for the Abbey production that we were talking about. Absolutely, yes. So yeah, um, I, I guess that's that's the, the, the only reason why Sia uh, asked uh, me to fill in for Bubis uh, for for two three shows is just because we just look at the same from far at least. Yeah, from the hair. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just a little bit taller, so that's it. Yeah, yeah. You, but but yeah, for the Abbey shows I'm wearing high heels, so. <laughs> All right, so, and then a second shout out here from Flo. Hey, buddy. Hey, Flo. Hey. <laughs> you even got a heart from him. Nice. Oh, oh. Okay, here, so there's a follow up question from Carlos. Um, yeah. Is the PSM transmitting full PCM or some Lucy codec in the headphones? How big is the difference? Hmm. I'm not sure if I understand the question 100%, to be honest. Me, me too. So, um, what I'm doing is I'm taking the unit out of the box, um, set up some power, <laughs> uh, most of the time start at minus 6 dB, and uh, sending some signals into it. You so, know what, I, I think I might have an oh, idea what Carlos means. Um, okay. if, if we need like a Tell special me. mode to have, you know, like a 3D for, for Klang coming there. Ah, no, 
No, that actually no. is encoded in the audio already. So no yes. matter where you send it, if it's going to a, to a hard wired headphone amp or to an, a PSM1000 or whatever, um, that just transmits the audio that is already encoded with the spatial information. Yeah. yeah. Oops. Carlos, uh, feel free to okay. just uh, clarify that a, a bit more in case we misunderstood you here. Um, there's a question from uh, Ralf. How do you mix the stereo keyboards on the keyboarders in-ears? They are mostly used uh, to the stereo sound. And how do they react if you put it in the 3D world? Myself, I like to keep them stereo and the rest of the band in 3D. Yeah. Um, it, it depends which uh, musician um, is it's playing, but um, as far as I remember, it's also that they're, they're placing their own keyboard sounds in the stereo field and um, to, have, to feeling more comfortable about it, I guess. Um, but that's what I'm, um, most of the time what I'm uh, seeing uh, when I'm working with Clang and keyboarders that they're uh, placing the signals in the stereo um, image. And at the end, they have to be happy. And when they used to hear it in stereo, then also in Clang, they have to hear it in stereo. That's it. Well, that, that's that's actually a really good point, um, and that's something that we try to 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 um, uh, to uh, mention always in our trainings and seminars as well, is that there's no rule that you have to put everything in 3D. You know, it's a tool. It's not more. It's not less. So you use it for yeah. each signal where it actually has a benefit, a beneficial effect on it. And if it's you know, if you feel that your keyboard sound better in stereo, and only the rest of the band is around you. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's that's totally absolutely, fine. yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. Um, um, <laughs> Pasi says, "Hi, guys. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting to hear how somebody else mixes the same artist. That's funny, actually. Yeah. Now now we're th <laughs> three guys work that uh, worked on the same production. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, Pasi. I hope you're doing well. I've been meaning to call you. I will do that on the weekend probably." So, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, my mouse lost the battery again. I don't know what's wrong with that thing here. I have to change my battery every three days. Either I'm working too hard or the mouse is broken. So, um, okay, follow-up question from Carlos. So the Lucy codec doesn't affect the spatiality. I'm, I'm still not 100% sure. I'm, I'm very sorry, Carlos. Um, Maybe maybe you mean that there's a loss in the in the audio how it's transmitted with the PSM, because I mean every every um, every wireless transmitter that is doing stereo, no matter if it's Shure or Sennheiser, they are using a special kind of um, processing, some MS, something that different, to actually fit two channels into one wireless frequency. So that oh that might actually make sense, yeah, um, because actually if you if you're using like the like cheap wireless transmitters, um, the stereo image is probably not very precise. Um, but I think with PSM thousands or the bigger Sennheisers, I don't think we are really running into that. What What do you think, Bush? Um, I don't know. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, I'm not into uh, um, into that uh, um, uh, specific technical um, stuff. Okay. So what, what, what yeah, you're really, saying is, I'd... if it sounds good, it is good. And I think I, yeah. I, I have to totally agree. Um, Carlos, um, feel free to just um, send us an email afterwards or something if, if you have a specific question. Maybe it's, it might also be a question that we cannot uh, answer. Maybe that's some a question for sure or for Sennheiser. Um, but what we can say is that um, uh, Bobis and nearly every other Klang user are using uh, either, either Shure or Sennheiser or one of the one of the the, the, the usual spa suspects, and um, no, you're not you losing any spatiality um, through the RF. No, don't worry about that. Oh. Okay, um, let's see. Another one from Carlos. Carlos, I love it that you're asking so many questions. Uh, and I, mean that's, I, I mean that seriously. Um, that's, it makes it really interesting. Have you tried broadcast a binaural mix from the Klang via MP3, MP4A? That's where I'm going to. Bobis, did you do that? 
Um, no, I didn't. What I was doing um, with a with a studio mix was mix through Clang, and um, just to create a binaural um, binaural mix um, with the Clang units, um, but not on a broadcast state uh, so far. Um, but what I think what is uh, getting really really interesting for the future. Uh, because in nowadays, with all those, uh, or with the coronavirus um, craziness all over the world, and um, British, uh, you were, uh, was talking about it with the uh, in America, in the US, with all those churches, where they're using now Clang to getting better mixes for the for the live streaming or broadcast. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, so I guess the question um, boils down to to that that Carlos is asking if the the losses that an MP3 or MP4A uh, conversion would would bring with us, if that makes the spatialization impossible. Um, well, um, it there are some some factors in the audio which are quite important for a clear spatialization. Um, two of those would be transients and the high frequencies and both suffer quite a bit from from an mp3 conversion however if you're using something over 160 kilobit per second or something like that then you should be fine and you can you can definitely hear all the positions um, but the clearest positions will of course be with with just um, unchanged audio with in full quality um, that said uh, we have many many clients who are doing live streaming concerts especially at this time right now and all those streams are um, sent through all kinds of, you know, algorithms and, uh, you know, um, uh, formats which are losing some quality of the audio. So until a certain point, <coughs> you're going to be totally fine with that. Um, but just, just try it, you know, it's, it's, it's quickly to try it. But I would say if you're above 160 kilobit per second, then you should be okay. Um, okay. Bubis, I think there's a friend of yours, or family. Oh yeah, same, same. No, <laughs> no friend. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> almost. <Nice. yeah. laughs> okay. Um, uh, Oli is. Oh, he's jumping in for that. Yes. Um, I I think we 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 uh, are on the same page with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So data reduction will have some loss of spatial inf information, but only if you go really low. And I think nowadays the internet is fast enough that nobody's doing like bad MP3s anymore. I hope the audio <laughs> file in me hopes really, really much about that, that, that this doesn't happen. Um, yeah, that's it. I think that were all the questions. I'm not seeing any hmm. ones right now. Um, and we actually, um, yeah, we, so, so far from my plan to stay within one hour. <laughs> ha -ha. Ha -ha. But that's, that's totally fine. Bubis, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, thank you. I would say, uh, guys, if anyone has further questions, um, feel free to just keep commenting um, even after we, we finish this, this live part here or send us an email. Um, if it's a specific question for Bubis, um, we will be happy to forward the question to him and um, make sure he answers all of them. We will force him to do that. I will do that for sure. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, so yeah, get get in touch with us. Ask us questions. Um, stay tuned for the next couple of webinars that we're doing. Um, next week on Tuesday, we're doing a webinar on using Klang uh, as a personal monitoring tool. So uh, basically, we will continue with with what uh, we were talking about with the Abbey Band, where a, a big chunk of the band is using that. And on Thursday, we will have another guest. Um, and this time, it won't be a sound engineer. It will be a musician. That will be a really interesting one. And we want to talk also about his uh, view on Klang um, and how he perceives it as a musician after using it for many years already. Um, and we will continue all that. We will do webinars uh, as long as we are all locked in. And we will probably continue afterwards. But also, uh, both, I think I can say that for both of us, Bobis, uh, we both are very, very much looking forward to seeing you guys face to face again and doing yeah. hands on trainings. And as soon as we are allowed Absolutely. to do that, we will definitely go on with that. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, have a really nice long weekend for, I think, most, most of the world, actually, with Labor Day tomorrow. Um, so, 
See you very soon. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye. Thank yeah. you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.